first point on the agenda is continuing the extension registry discussion, but we're probably going to delay that because Corbin isn't here and he was probably the one most interested in that. Um, so I'll, I'll bring up um, my discussion of EEP 5139. Um, it's something that came out of the uh, URL working group discussion that we've been having with on the EIP side of things. And the idea is that um, uh, th th there's kind of like a uh, a desire to deprecate the RPC endpoint that lets you add ar uh, arbitrary uh, RPC providers to your wallet um, because it's kind of bad form to just add any RPC provider. It's insecure. It, it has risks with it. Um, so uh, we decided to throw together an EIP on um, lists of RPC providers that are similar to Uniswap's token RPC or token lists. Um, so. That's what this is. I don't know if any of you have read it or have any opinions on it. Um, if you haven't read it, read it. Talk, we can talk about it in the channel. Um, would anybody be opposed to implementing these kind of RPC provider lists and deprecating um, the RPC endpoint to add one? Um, yeah, just interested to hear everybody's thoughts on that. Interesting. Okay. So um, just for a bit of context, I was there when we talked about initially writing this. Um, I haven't seen it since. So could you run me through like what the um, final user experience kind of looks like with this? Sure. So it would be a um, modification to the wallet UI. Uh, so in the settings somewhere, you would have a... a a field where you can add a URL to a list. It might be on ENS, it might be on HTTP. And um, that list is... So uh, are you familiar with Adblock or, or uBlock Origin or any of those kind of extensions? Yep. So it work pretty much exactly like that. You subscribe to a filter list or you like in Adblock and in, in wallets, you subscribe to an RPC provider list. And the idea is that you'd have some kind of curator, uh, probably initially the wallet itself... Uh, like would be the default, and that curator would keep a list of supported RPC endpoints, and so that would let you switch between networks like, you know, Robston and Gurley and um, things like Polygon, and that's kind of the idea behind this. So instead of letting people add random RPC endpoints, they choose the list that has the RPC endpoints they want. I hope that kind of answers your question. <laughs> yeah, sweet. Um, I see a fair bit of other things, and I see versioning and everything, and I'm really interested. Like, is there some 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 magic happening here? Um, um, there's no 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 real magic there. It's um, kind of an extent. Like, it's basically the Uniswap token list, just. Uh, yeah. repurposed for RPC providers. So the version gives you a kind of guideline for users to expect what will happen when a version number changes. Mm -hmm. So like, let's say uh, the version number on the list that's published on, on the 3 ENS uh, increases a major version. That might mean that they are removing, uh, let's say, a testnet. And dApps that use that testnet will no longer work. Uh, whereas if you have like a, a patch change, so the last number, that could be a bug fix or adding redundancy or, or something along those lines. So it gives you a lot of, like, it gives you like an indication of what might be changing to the end user. Cool. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out that, you know, I, I didn't see when I was looking at it. Um, for Uniswap and Compound, anyone who really maintains a list, there have been moments where um, other people maintain a forked version of that list and they don't update it at a regular schedule and it's led to exploits. Um, maybe there's a way that, you know, if you're going to fork that primary list or you're going to use some version of it, maybe you can subscribe to some email list like Geth does. This way you can know when there's a newly updated version or, you know, something that you have to roll into your, your solution. Well, that'd be interesting. So maybe like a, a, a contact email, I guess, wouldn't really be, wouldn't make sense, but some kind mm -hmm. of like um, place you could subscribe for text updates. That, that'd be interesting. Or at least a piece of software that'll alert you. Yeah. Like, a, like an RSS feed would work as well. 
could that problem be solved instead by supporting some sort of uh, list extension mechanism? So where you say, um, so instead of having to fork a list, you can say, I would like to extend this list. And so my list is whatever's on list A plus or minus these items. Yeah, that, that's also a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's actually like a JSON diff format that we could use for that. Um, I, I can look into it. I like where this is heading. Um, I, if I'm not mistaken, you can have custom like profile pictures for lists, correct? Uh, yeah, you can have a logo for the list, and you can have. Um, I think you can have a logo for the IPC provider, but yeah, don't hold Sweet. me to that. Cool. So Sam and chat raised a good point here, which is. Um, it makes it very difficult for users to add custom RPZ providers um, because you have to fork a list and then edit some JSON and put it in. And I think that's part of the point of it is to make it difficult. Um, and, you know, I think Micah brought up really good points. I don't know if you want to bring them up again here about why it's bad to add RPC endpoints. But, like, but if you want to, go ahead. Um, it's early in the morning. I don't remember. I don't remember <laughs> I felt strongly. Yeah, so so there's the like the uh, the most mundane thing or at least harmful thing they could do is just watch you um, and see what you're doing and, and uh, keep track of your like signed messages and what dApps you're interacting with and you use that for like nefarious purposes, maybe targeted marketing or uh, even feeding it into some kind of a, a scammer pipeline um, and and more malicious things you could do is. Um, delay updates to the chain or even send completely wrong information and if your wallet isn't um, checking with multiple RPC providers then you'd have no way of knowing so um, if you add a, a custom RPC provider from say a random dApp they could feed you fake information about the polygon or, or something along those lines and we're getting <laughs> so these are red herring arguments all right why What you described bring, brings a bell. Uh, the, the core issue here is that RPC, the RPC endpoint you connect to is your view and your communication channel into that blockchain. And if someone adds a malicious one, they can you know, do bad things with that privileged position. And so the idea is, is, generally speaking, users should be relatively careful about what RPC endpoints they add and they should be getting them from a trusted source. You should not be adding RPC endpoints that some guy wrote on a bathroom wall, for example. Would this not potentially reduce the possibility that new RPC providers you know, become popular? Um, and it feels like it would tend to uh, I'm not sure what the exact word is, but just like Cent centralize, yeah, centralize and solidify the position of, say, Infura. Uh, one of the things I've been hoping to see is uh, more diversity in in RPC endpoints uh, that users are using for, you know, say when they're not specifically using Adapt that chooses its own, and if you're just doing simple sends or whatever the default is, um, like. Want more people to say use Omnia or Poct. So to be clear, I, I do think users should be able to add RPC endpoints. What I am very um, apprehensive about is DApps adding endpoints on behalf of users. So like, what I don't want to see is a button on a DApp that's like just on a website somewhere that says, "Click here to add our add Polygon RPC endpoint to MetaMask or whatever." Like that's the thing that's dangerous. It's having a user have the ability to add, like for a simple example, I have my own um, Ethereum client that I run, and in everywhere I can, I use it. I do not use Infura. I do not use QuickNode. I use my own. And I definitely think, I mean, that's that is the ideal way to use Ethereum, right? That is the most censorship resistant way, and we definitely want to support that. What we want to be careful of is making it so DApps themselves can suggest. RPC endpoints because that is a vector for scams and attacks. Would this list of RPC endpoints be in any way encouraging people to 
pick, you know, the not the top most popular one uh, in order to encourage people to say try a different one than in Fura or what have you. Um, because otherwise, like, I'm not sure how users will learn that they can change their RPC provider if they can't see it in the DAP. Um, I think something that like might partially satisfy that is that um, if this list gets refetched every once in a while, then if like wherever it's getting refetched from is dynamic, they could do something like order them by speed or order them by like availability or response time or something like that, right? So the place where the RPC provider list is hosted doesn't just have to be plain static, this is the list. It could also be, I don't know, like a, a Node.js instance or something um, that can check the high speeds and then order them by speed and then send that out. So the next time somebody requests a list of providers, they would get them ordered by speed. Or like, there, we need to find some way to, to or we don't need to, but like, it would be optimal if we could find a way to sort them somehow um, without allowing, obviously, spoofing of speed. Um so that users get varied RPC endpoints, yet still, you know, the one with the least load. Does that make any sense? Yeah, I think so. And that's part of what I tried to do, roughly, in, in this the proposal so far, which is uh, you can specify multiple uh, like entities as RPC providers. So like if you're a pocket, like whatever, and each one of those can specify multiple URLs and then the wallet can choose to query multiple independent entities and choose one URL from each entity to query. So they can do like quorum kind of querying. We should probably, I feel like there, there might be value in um, having some sort of priority system. So. Like, I can imagine if I had a list of my own, and in my personal list, I include my personal Ethereum node, which I implicitly trust. I may have a backup of Infira and QuickNode and Alchemy, or whatever. And um, I would want to always use my node, no matter what. But if it's down, then fall back to a quorum between the other three. So I would have priority one set for my node, and then priority two set for the other you know, three or four. Um, and endpoints, and then you know the wallet could then choose how to use that information, but it would allow me to convey to the to the wallet, hey, this one is better. Please use this if it's available, and use these if it's not. So I don't think the list format right now. So I mean, the list format right now does not support ordering it by priority, but it does give the enough information to order it by a priority. Where? So, so like it's grouped into different RPC providers. So you could say like Infura is priority four, but you'd set that in the wallet UI uh, as opposed to in the list itself. I mean, you you could set it in the list, but obviously I'd have to change the spec for that. Right. So I, I, it feels like so they hope what I'm, what I'm imagining is that if someone adds an RPC list, they they don't have to then go and fiddle with things. In the, in the wallet. And so the RPC list is presumably from a semi-trusted source, at least, that can make these sorts of decisions. And I don't want the user to have to then go and add the list and then say, okay, well, now I need to supply the supplemental information that is not included in the list, such as priorities. All right, so would you be satisfied with something like an integer for each provider if the integers are the same for multiple providers, try all of them and get a majority vote, and uh, I think, if what? I think, it's, I think it's a little more prescriptive than I would like. Just having a prior, an intro priority, uh, I think, is enough, and then it's up to the wallet to decide what to do with that. So some okay. wallets may just uh, randomly choose one, some may do a quorum, some may do, uh, if anyone disagrees, then warn, like, depending on your security level. Okay, cool. Something else that could be possible is to create like a, a field within the wallet that's like uh, prioritization, and it, you could prioritize based on speed. Just take the list, whatever's fastest, I'll use that because the list works. Um, in Micah's case, you could do custom. You want to prioritize your node first, followed by anything in this list, ranked by speed. 
but it gives you the option of, you know, selecting your ranking mechanism. I do wonder if the, the things that are most important to users about which RPC endpoint to select are not instead subjective or uh, more complicated measures like uh, are there privacy features on this? Like Omni offers a, a mix net for their ingress. Uh, and yeah, it might not be the fastest. And, you know, NPR might be faster, but I'm not so sure that it's obvious how... I, I guess maybe that's up to the, the, the curator providing yeah. the list uh, as to how they order things. Um, yeah, I think... Uh, in my mind, that is exactly what the priority would be used for as well. It's like, I, I might put, you know, my node is number one, and then something that has privacy features like a mix net that it routes things through as number two, and then the number threes are just traditional centralized services. And then it's up to the wall at that point to decide what to do with that information, but at least the user doesn't need to understand that uh, the list provider is one that needs to understand all those details. Doesn't this then just push the issue back one level and then users need to know who is a a reputable or trustworthy yes. provider. Yes, the the hope here though is that they only need, so if you imagine a future world where there's hundreds of L2s, you need one reputable list provider rather than a hundred reputable RPC endpoint providers. And so for a user, this becomes a much simpler problem of, or even a wallet. It's like, it may be that the wallet will just come with a default list. And now the wallets don't need to manually curate a hundred RPC endpoints. They can manually curate one list and then delegate that responsibility to some third party that is known to be good at creating these lists. I do think this could be beneficial but I also am concerned about how this might long-term reduce the likelihood that users will use, you know, non, you know, top five RPC providers, uh, or might, you know, whether they might switch away from Infura. I'm not saying Infura is bad, but you know, diversity. It's, it's centralized. Yeah. So I think I'm kind of hoping that with this, we'll end up with uh, a few well-known lists that are. Uh, more permissive than the default wallet ones. Um, so, like, for example, somebody might just grab all of the wallet lists, merge them together, and then you have one that just has all the RPC endpoints for all the wallets. Or you might have uh, somebody who goes out and finds, like, the Polygon, the Arbitrum, the Optimism, and they, they just list all of the official RPC providers for all of the uh, networks and adds those to a list. So, And then as that list curator finds more L2s, they'll add them, and then users get it for free, which I think is better than what we have right now. But... I do weakly agree with Rosenfire's or just Justin's general concern that of stickiness. Um, I don't think the lists necessarily solve the stickiness problem, but I don't think they strictly make it worse either. Um, like the, the the only alternative that I think would remove stickiness is requiring. It's kind of like what we have now, where we require users to manually insert everyone, but I think that is unsustainable uh, from a UX perspective, and we need something. And I think token lists is the currently best option for, that I've heard at least, that makes it so users don't have to manually add every single RPC endpoint, um, yet it's still somewhat flexible and allows users to make some amount of their own choice. I'm certainly open to ideas that would remove that stickiness somehow, but at the same time, don't result in just a, a painful UX for users where they have to add every single RPC, research and add every single RPC provider manually. I don't think the lists are categorically, you know, worse in, in terms of, you know, the, the stickiness problem either, because, you know, much like a, like an ETF in the stock market, you can have like, you know, the, the S&P 500, which everyone's going to use. It's like the basic, you know, authorized endpoints. Then you can have your Russell 2000, which is a whole bunch of other diverse endpoints that someone has checked and curated into a list. 
and you can trust that provider to tell you, hey, this is a larger list, but it's meant to increase diversity. And people would definitely pick that up because, you know, some people don't even know how to get those endpoints or to find them themselves. I do think that the idea of the of having these lists is a good idea, for sure. No argument there. Uh, I would wonder if we can decouple the idea of of kind of like restricting uh, DAPs or anything from suggesting changes from that idea, um, because it's not itself a bad idea. I'm just not so sure that it makes sense to couple those two things together. Sorry, I think I missed which two things. It, it, it seems that there are two related ideas here. One is this, this uh, uh, endpoint list uh, format functionality. The other is the idea that dApps should not be able to suggest RPC changes to users. Or am I misunderstanding that? No, I think that makes sense. And I think, you know, if, if dApps can't suggest oh, uh, RPC endpoints to users, I think there needs to be a, an additional way to get them to users somehow. And, you know, I think lists is a pretty good way of doing it. All right, so I think discussion has mostly died down on this topic. Um, I'll make a few changes, and then I'll bring it back up at the next meeting, and we can talk about it some more. Um, unless somebody else has any other comments, we can move to something else. I am currently starting a prototype of um, something that will be able to sort based on speed and then return a list in whatever format you may end up settling on. Oh, cool. That'd, that'd be awesome. Okay. We'll have also so, our first little demo site uh, ready. <laughs> so should we suggest in the spec that the order in the list is the order? Oh, well, I guess we have the priority for that. And then, okay. Yeah, okay. So I'll we'll add priority and maybe a list extension thing. And yeah, okay. I think if, if you want to do list extension, um, you may want to switch from an array to... An object, so uh, overrides are easy. Um, okay, yeah. So I, I'll change it to like be keyed off of a domain or a name or something. Yeah, like I, I don't know what the because a single domain may offer multiple RPC endpoints. Yeah. So enough domains right key, but yes, yeah, so some sort of key so that they can, and maybe the key is just up to the list author. Like it can just be. You know, numbers or some arbitrary value. Or, yeah. yeah, some arbitrary value, just so that when you do an extension to that list, um, it's assumed that those keys are stable, and so they can okay. be overridden. Say, I want to replace this one, but otherwise use that list. Cool. Yeah, I'll keep that in mind. All right. So I think we have uh, zk doof talking about the Wallet Plug Fest and interoperability test event. Yeah. So this is a. Um something that we were trying to get going earlier with the uh, cat herders. But the idea was to take a whole bunch of wallet devs and a whole bunch of DAP developers and some middleware people as well, you know, and kind of stagger them. So you would go through a whole bunch of different DAPs or a whole bunch of different pieces of middleware, and you would test interoperability with all of them in the attempt to find issues and to find bugs that, you know, you could, you know, debug on the fly or try and solve or either just put on your backlog. The goal was to find what issues come up the most often and then see if those translate to potential new EIPs or, or just general changes that need to be implemented. Since we have a whole lot of wallet devs here, I figured, you know, you guys might be interested in that.
asked, maybe I was wrong. <laughs> I was going to say, uh, Jake from BLS Wallet here, um, we definitely be interested in doing that. We haven't gone through the process, but we have some uh, like backlog issues to try out our prototype extension with a bunch of different like D apps. So doing that in a more um, structured environment would probably be pretty good for us. Great. Yeah, that, that'd be great. Um, I'd, I'd pretty much just be looking for anyone who is interested at the moment and then seeing if we can extend this current group and reach out to some DAP developers, see who wants to try and break a wallet, you know, see where, where the flaws are. And the flaws could be on the DAP side as well in terms of their implementation. So I, I think it is a pretty win-win situation for everyone involved. And if it's done at some you know, regular interval, maybe once a quarter, people can at least see, you know, the, the updates and make sure that their dApps and their wallets are, are working better. Yeah, I think I would definitely be interested in this too. This is Alex from Tally Wallet, and it's something that we try to do quarterly with our community, but it never ends up happening. So I think it'd be a good idea to just like do it ourselves and like you said, with uh, dApp authors and whatnot. Great. Yeah, I'll, I'll put something into the chat later, just saying, hey, who's interested, and see if I can start getting a list together. Cool. That kind of ties into one of the other ideas we were talking about on the last call, um, where we, do you guys remember uh, the, the web acid tests, the website you could go on that would just test your browser? Yeah, yeah, that's yes. a really good idea. Yeah. Because I, I feel like we could probably get a like we're all front end ish developers except me so um we could probably make a test site that you can go on with your wallet and just click a button and it'll tell you how compliant your wallet is and maybe we can use that to i don't know i don't want to say shame people into doing better but i know there are some wallets that are less compatible than others um may and might be a useful tool for for everybody else too so i feel like that I feel like that sort of thing is more useful if you actually have a specification to uh, target. We we do sort of, right? We have the ETH API spec. <clears throat> I mean, sort of. I mean, that spec is ill, very ill-defined. Yeah, yeah. So maybe, maybe the tests become the new spec. I don't know. But... Uh... I still sure. think it's an idea worth pursuing. Yeah, I think it's a good idea in general. Yeah, another thing I could see is maybe as we do these test events, you know, before there's an EIP proposal or anything, or maybe if the issues are pretty small, like just common implementation issues, those can easily be pulled into, you know, the the uh, shame test site where it goes, okay, this is a common implementation mistake. This is a common browser configuration mistake. Um, we don't need to necessarily put that into an EIP, but here you go. Here's how you test it. Yes, yeah, so that's a really good point uh, about it being difficult to detect, detect some features and characteristics. Um, and I think even pointing a wallet at a alternate chain w might be difficult. Um, so it might be difficult to do tests of like you know sending transactions and whether a signed transaction broadcasts it or not. Um, but I think that I don't think those are insurmountable problems. All right, so um, I guess we'll try to get that scheduled at some point. Get some app developers on. Um, in the meantime, I think. Uh, we have someone from ethereum.org here to talk about uh, the progress on updating their page. Yeah, hey. Do you mind, guys mind if I share my screen really quick? Is that okay? Yeah, please do. All right, one sec here. Um, can you see my screen okay? I can, yeah. Yep. Cool. Um, so yeah, just wanted to... I guess mentioned we're working on updating our find wallet page on ethereum.org. So currently this is kind of what or this is what the page looks like today. So it's not really the best user experience when it comes to looking for features that wallets have. It's also pretty out of date. There's been 
think it's been a few years since this page has been um, touched. So, I mean, there's been a number of features, NFTs being an example, that have like come to the ecosystem that haven't been represented on our website yet, um, as well as our kind of like user experience for selecting a wallet is a little bit overwhelming. We list 40 wallets on ethereum.org and they're kind of randomized order and users don't really have the best time uh, finding a wallet for their needs. So we've been working on an updated version here of the page. Um, and so this is just kind of dummy data. So if when your wallet is on here and these features aren't right, just it's just dummy data right now. So um, basically what we were looking to do with this page is come up with um, some user personas that will fit kind of users in the Ethereum ecosystem, as well as a more in-depth feature uh, filter. So people who have specific needs or features that they're looking for um, can find a wallet that supports it. They can toggle them and then find the wallets that, that support these features. Um, just making it a little bit easier for uh, users to come find a wallet. And then as well, we tried to add some better compare features. So in the top here, we're looking to make it so that users can you know, select a couple uh, features that are important to them and then um, be able to compare just in kind of a list, uh, finding wallets that support the features that they're looking for and being able to find like the best wallet for their use case. Um, so I guess with that, Part of what we're wanted to kind of bring up, since uh, plenty of people working on wallets here, obviously, is we're kind of we're looking for uh, data to be submitted on wallets so that we can list them and have accurate information. So that um, I mean, like when we put this live, if a wallet hasn't submitted updated information, they'll still be shown. But likely, when users are going to filter on features that they want to have in a wallet. If we don't have that up-to-date information, uh, they'll likely be filtered out, even if they shouldn't be, just because we won't have updated data. So we created a new wallet listing template. Um, I can share it in general if that's fine with you guys. But um, basically just looking to get anyone uh, working on a wallet to submit updated information for their wallets so we can accurately show uh, your wallet projects on ethereum.org. Um, mainly the rundown. If there's any feedback as well on our, like the direction we're going, um, this is currently the open pull request for this feature or this page, I guess, rather. Um, so any feedback would also be really appreciated on what we're doing here. I have two totally unrelated questions. Um, one, what is your guys' curation process? Like, imagine I'm a scammer and I create a wallet and then submit it. How do you avoid listing my wallet? Um, yeah, so right now, so in order to be shown on ethereum.org, you have to first fill out this issue template. And then the team, uh, there's about 10 of us, so a few of us will talk about a wallet being listed and if it's kind of like met the criteria that we've set out here um, in terms of like fulfilling that. So if a wallet, let's say, is just like a scam fork, uh, we should be able to look and like, oh, is, does it have an active development team? Um, when did the project go live? Like there should be some things that we notice when someone submits a wallet that should hopefully stand out. Um, but we'll also try and talk to um, people in the community as well to make sure that we're not, you know, listing a scam wallet or anything like that. But I think so far, this has been enough for us to just be able to get like a gut check on if this wallet or a wallet that's applying to be listed uh, is a scam or not for the most part. Yeah. And the other question, uh, do you happen to have analytic data for the current website on what features users are searching for when they're looking for wallets? Um, not at the moment, but we are adding some. So we use Matomo on Ethereum.org to uh, gather the stuff. So we're going to be adding Matomo events onto, um, you know, when users are clicking these different features. So we should be able to get an idea of what users are 
selecting when it comes to features. Uh, the idea would be like we could track down the Matomo events that someone clicked before selecting a wallet, um, and we should be able to get an idea. And the idea behind some of that as well is we should be able to use that to come back to our user profiles and like reassess as time goes on so we can hopefully build out better user profiles as well. Yeah, the, the one thing I'm very curious about is the there's a wallet one wallet feature that is a feature for the wallet author and I'm not it's not clear to me that it is actually a feature users want kind of like ad, advertising right like you know Google puts ads, but that is not something that the users want in their search, is what Google wants in their search, and that is buying crypto and swapping crypto with their wallet. Um, I've always been curious if that is added to wallets because users actually want those features in their wallet, or because it's what makes wallets money. And so I'd be curious if users are actually looking for that, or if that's just something that, you know, wallets add as a revenue generating scheme. Yeah, that's... <laughs> I don't necessarily have the answer to that, but I could definitely, once we start Collecting some of that data, I can share it with you if you'd be interested. Yeah, I'm, I'm very interested. And that one in particular, again, it's, it's essentially <laughs> swap features and buy and sell features are the equivalent of ads for the revenue model for wallets. As somebody who's used the swap feature when I'm feeling really lazy, I, I think they're slightly more useful to users than ads, but yeah, I think I agree with your sentiment. Yeah. Like I have never used it, used it at all. I always, you know, use a, a purpose-built thing for those features. Like if I'm going to buy crypto, I go to a site that specializes in buying crypto. Not something that added it as a add-on. Oh yeah, like I can't even buy crypto using the in-wallet ones. None of them work in Canada. So <laughs> <laughs> right. Yep. <laughs> Feel that one. Love the love the new site, and would uh, definitely be interested in seeing analytics as well. Cool. Um, yeah, so we have a designer on our team who's uh, kind of in charge of, I guess, curating our analytics when it comes to this. So I'll pass a message on to him that you guys would be interested in seeing this so he can share it as well. Cool. Thanks. Cool. If, you, uh, if you know offhand, like, how many people use the Ethereum site to find a wallet? So our find wallet page is about 5.5% of our monthly traffic. Um, and we get, I believe the last time I checked, we get roughly between 1 and 2 million views a month. Um, I mean, depending on the state of the market. So obviously probably this month it'll be quite low, but or lower. But uh, yeah, roughly 5 to 6% of our traffic is on this page. So not insignificant. That's that's cool. I think a lot of people are going to be interested in that that data. Yeah, it's a pretty big. Uh, both the wallet page in general, where you can like learn about wallets, and then the find wallet page. The combined, they account for about eleven percent of our page views. So wallets are definitely like a big, uh, a big part of our traffic on Ethereum.org. All right. I I like what it looks like. Um, however, when looking at the, uh, sort properties, right, there's a pretty nice list. I was wondering if there is, or if you have thought about adding, uh, whether or not a wallet supports Wallet Connect as a feature. We, that is one of our features that we, uh, have Wallet Connect is. One okay. Of them, yeah. And whether or not. Uh, and specifically which ones probably uh, of the URL specifications the wallet implements. So the specification for scanning URL to uh, invoke a transaction, for viewing a transaction, for etc, etc, etc. So 681, 831, 2400, etc. Um, don't have, I don't think we have anything for that at the moment, but okay. could you, sorry, what were those numbers again? It like, is 681. 681. Okay. Uh, 831. 831. 2400. Okay. And 5094. 5094. Okay, I'll take a look at those. Um, yeah. Sweet. Definitely look into, yeah, make sure we have a good amount or good features for users to be able to yes. 
use. So that's yeah. currently a topic Thanks. that's like close to my heart because I've been messing around with URLs and URL EIPs and proposing URL EIPs and uh, contributing back to the libraries that are used by the wallets. So voila. Awesome. Well, yeah, I have this written down to check out. Is there a list of EIPs that specifically relate to wallet functionality? And is, would it be beneficial to denote that in the wallet finder? That might be too technical for the audience of a wallet finder, but I don't know. That seems like a good way to identify features that users might want to search for. Yeah, I think, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, it does feel um, too technical for, for users to me. Yeah, I think that was our, our assumption for the most part right now is that most users are gonna be pretty new to the space when they're coming and finding a wallet. And um, well, I'm sure a more advanced user would benefit from having that on the page. I don't know that that's necessarily most of the traffic we get, but it's definitely something that um, I'll write down to think about or bring up with people. Thinking about things on the roadmap, Wallet Connect V2 uh, adoption might be a bit of a bumpy ride, so maybe some way of breaking out Wallet Connect V1 versus V2 in the next few months. Yeah, we were talking about that. I think we were waiting until it was out of beta to cross that bridge. Awesome. Cool. So that sounds like the end of uh, scheduled discussion. I don't know if there's anything you guys want to talk about, but we can just end it here if you want or hang out and chat. Did you want to talk about um, whatever it was you asked me if I was still interested in talking about in this call? Oh, the extension registry yeah. stuff. Yeah, we can chat about that a little bit. Uh, so, at the during the last meeting, we were discussing um, different ways for wallets to communicate with the pages, um, like apps, and. Uh, so the, the current standard way of doing it with window.ethereum isn't really great, uh, and it's um, difficult for, say, like Wallet Connect or um, Web3 Modal to support new wallets because they have to add custom code for each new wallet that comes along. So um, Corbin of Sequence Wallet um, was brainstorming some ways of um, hijacking window.ethereum so that it could support multiple wallets. Um, and I think Mike and I also proposed alternate ways of doing communication between uh, web, like web extensions and web pages. Um, mine uses a uh, custom scheme handler, so like you know how Mail2 is like Mail2 colon is a scheme. You can actually register them, so like web.edm or web, web3, something along those lines, and you can click on it and open a post message to the extension. Um, and I think Micah has a sim similar kind of implementation. You don't have to remember what my complaints with your scheme solution were, do you? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I don't. <laughs> okay. But um, just check it because I don't. I yeah, remember so, there's so, something about it that made me a little uncomfortable, and uh, I, I like it, and I want to to like it, but there was something that was weird about it. Yeah. Yeah. Are we talking about the Web three one or which one? Uh, so, so I. I this is unrelated to any of the existing URL standards. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's just literally the URL is just, I think mine is EVM, uh, web plus EVM colon slash slash slash, and that's the whole URL. And uh, you, you open that in an iframe, and uh, the extension can handle it, and you can post message to the extension through that. And the benefits of this are you don't need any custom permissions. So right now, every wallet needs like full permissions on every page to inject a script. Uh, with this uh, scheme like handler, you don't need any permissions at all, which is kind of nice. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. And what is the with the scheme handler? Um... Does that prompt once for a web page? If you if you don't check the box for remember this, you get one prompt for the entire life of that page, or 
Like, what's the lifetime? Of, of so you would get one. So yeah. So I guess another advantage of it is that it uses the browser's built-in um, UI for choosing a handler. Uh, so like, if you had five extensions installed, you'd get to pick. Um, okay. But the downside is you don't get to control how it saves it. So you have so for Firefox at least, um, the option is permanently save forever, or uh, don't save and don't save would be like as long as the iframe is open, it wouldn't prompt again. So, uh, okay. so, it'd be so up to you, you do get you do get a channel that survives the life of, of that page. Or the yeah, exactly. Place. Yeah. And, and why do you need an iframe for this? Uh, because you need to be able to post message to it. So, uh, like if you you could just directly navigate to the page like in a new tab or something, but that'd be kind of weird. So the iframe, you just hide it uh, so that you can post message to that page. What do you mean that page? So imagine I'm a dApp. I want to connect to a wallet. Um, yep. Why can't I just do web3 plus cvm colon slash slash details that I want to send? Uh, I mean, so then it would prompt every time you um, open one uh, of those every I see. So the the full link is what triggers the the reprompt. So if you use no each request uh, triggers the reprompt. Oh, I see. Okay, so you're using this as a one time round trip to open a communication channel. Yes. Not for actual data passing. Exactly. I mean, you could you could absolutely encode. So kind of what I was thinking down the road from this is we want to move away from. Uh, web ex well, I mean, I want to move away from web extensions as wallets, and um, you can actually have an external program handle the links as well. So you could put the the let's say the wallet connect information into the URL so that touche. That is pretty cool. Yeah. Then, like so, your like your desktop app could become directly your wallet as opposed to through MetaMask or through something else. Yeah, exactly. Would have to play around with it. I've never done any of this stuff before. Like I said earlier, I'm not a front-end developer. But I think this sounds like it might possibly be doable. So, yeah. This sounds su surprisingly like this is doable. I'm just questioning why we aren't doing this already. It's new. Thanks. Stickies. Defaults are sticky and they're difficult to get away from. Like, I've been trying to Fair. Convince the world with a complete and utter failure because it mostly just shouting into the wind uh, to move away from the injection thing for like three years now. <laughs> but uh, it, it's difficult to get people to change. And support for registering custom protocol handlers is uh, relatively new. I, I think Chrome kind of pushed it through so that they could handle email links. Um, but now it's supported in like Edge, Opera, uh, Brave, Chrome, Firefox, so... Hypothetically, if you wanted to have a desktop wallet that you connect to, um, how, how would that look? Like, what would... Sure, so I believe the way Wallet Connect works right now is that it encodes a URL into the uh, QR code, and that URL contains you'd the to, information. Hmm? So you'd have to bounce through a third-party service. I wish we could... Uh, yeah, I hey, mean... What I'm getting at is... Uh, I, I would... I'm not a per I'm, I'm not a fan of the Wallet Connect. Like I'm a fan of the Wallet Connect in theory, but I'm not a fan of in practice because uh, you end up um, having to route through some centralized third party, yep. and that third party then has you know power to censor or power to lie, etc. So there are some and neat so neat tricks with this. So you can actually so in that URL you could encode a like if you are local on the same machine. Um, but, I mean, you wouldn't even need to encode anything special. It's just when you configure a WebRTC connection, um, you can configure it with or without stun and turn and ice servers. If you configure it without any of those things, it doesn't require a third-party server. Um, but so, you, isn't you, the, so if, if you are in an app and you are sending a one-time, you, you basically a one-shot send a message right yep. over to the other thing, the... The web page can't host a service that your wallet can talk to. Yes, it can. You need information. Yeah. How? Uh, WebRTC with a, a data stream connection. So what normally happens is there is a third-party server, in this case, the Wallet Connect Central server, where one client, say your web browser, goes to advertise that it is looking for a connection from user XYZ. 
Um, and then it makes a QR code that goes to the Wallet Connect page, logs in as user XYZ, or and etc. So the moment somebody opens that URL in their wallet, the wallet essentially like goes to Wallet Connect, says, hey, I'm supposed to be XYZ, where's the, connect me with the client, right? And then the Wallet Connect server does, and keep in mind, this happens for Discord voice channels as well, right? The reason we're all connected now is because there's one Discord server that said, ta-da, connect. Um, even though they've done some sketchy shit after that, that's how it was originally made. Um, now they're routing everything to centralized servers, but that's besides the point. Essentially, so, so you need maybe the Wallet Connect server to be able to establish a connection between the two, but if you could encode the entirety of what you would normally be sending to that Wallet Connect server saying, hey, this is my session starting request message, then the QR code would get a lot more complicated, but hypothetically speaking, you wouldn't need a centralized server anymore. So, um, to be even more specific, um, the centralized server is required to bypass uh, NAT. Um, As well, yes. Yeah, so you don't actually need it at all to do a direct connection if there's no firewall, and if you're on the same machine, there's not going to be a firewall. See, I think the piece that I'm missing, I did not realize that your server could accept, your browser could accept an incoming connection. Yeah, I know, it's ridiculous, right? Yeah, I think that, that is new to me. Yeah, but it's all there. Like, okay. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very warm on the using the scheme handler thing. Like, like I, I very much like the idea. I'm still a little concerned about like the implementation details and whether we can make this UX actually work and end to end. And I would like to see a. I know you had like a, a demo. I'm, I'm worried that there's going to be some rough edges. You know, j just beyond the prototype. Uh, I mean, it'll basically be just Wallet Connect, but then, like, more native, right? Yeah, so you need Wallet Connect, yeah. but also have, a like, a post message option. So, like, when you click the link, it would generate the Wallet Connect URL and um, register a handler for post messages, and then open the iframe, and then whatever happens after it opens the iframe, be it receiving a post message or receiving a WebRTC connection, it proceeds from there. So this may be just me being slow and not not a front end dev full time. Uh, I still don't understand why you need a iframe here. Like, like why isn't okay, the, okay. so yeah, just you know saying hey, here's my web RTC server. Like, why does it need an iframe? Uh, I mean, yeah, I guess you don't if you just route everything over web RTC. Yeah, isn't that what we would presumably be wanting to do? Um, I think a lot of wallets today use post message to communicate, so I just followed that. But yeah, we could just use WebRTC for everything. And with post message, is the idea that yes, I still see the need for an iframe, even if you're using post message. Like, why not just post message to the window? What window? Like your uh, window dot. Post message or whatever, like to glo the global space. And why do you need no. to post to? Why do you There's need to post no a message to an iframe? Because the iframe will, when opened in quotation marks, the browser will go, "Oh shoot, this is a custom scheme." And instead of opening an actual site inside of the browser, you know, the way an iframe normally would do that it will pop out to your extension or pop out to your wallet desktop software you have open or pop out to the native app on your phone. Right? You're saying the only way the only way to get the browser to prompt where do you want to open mail to is by having the mail to in an iframe? Like I know it's not by true, having mail so. to in an iframe, yes. It or or a link. Like if you I just mean, have yeah, a mail to a link. link. But then they have to click it. Well then, and they click right. it and it replaces so the, the current it would replace the current page too, as opposed yeah. to just loading it. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, we need to the, the demo of this. <laughs> I think Sam has a demo. Uh, yep. I'm just trying to understand the implementation details. Like, like what I'm not getting is, so when I see a mail to link, right, I click it and it prompts me, what would you like to use for sending mail? And I say, you know, Proton or Gmail or whatever. And then it just takes me over to my already open Gmail or Proton tab. Like, there's no iframe involved here, yet I have successfully communicated between two apps that are 
isolate from each other. Or if I'm using you know, desktop mail app, it'll open in the desktop mail app. Like, yeah, there's no so iframe here, but this flow works. I don't understand why you need an iframe. Because there's no communication back to the, the, the originating page, right? So you click the mail to link, and the extension gets that request. And instead of actually doing anything with it, like HTTP-wise, it just switches tabs sure. and starts a new email. Right. So the... I, I think you said did say something crucial there, because with starts a new email, that means that, like, an email to link actually triggers an action and has somehow conveyed data, the email address in this case, to the open window. Right. So if you have Ethereum, EVM, whatever schema prefix... And then after that, the pairing details for WebRTC, then it would go to your wallet. The wallet would get the pairing details, show you a loading sign, a uh, loading spinner, connect over using WebRTC to the browser. And as soon as it's connected, go connected, connection established, whatever would you like to connect with XYZ, right? Yep. So you can that send your, your WebRTC, I lost the words, stun whatever, stun ice request, something like that, whatever that was called, um, in the URL, or sorry, URI, um, and that way we're sending it to the desktop application. Right. So right. You, you said, yes, all that makes sense, and I still don't see the, where the iframe comes in. Like, I'm so, so how do you send something, something back? back. IFrame anymore. Yeah, you, you don't need the iframe if you just use WebRTC, you just need the iframe to do yeah. post message. So we don't even need the iframe anymore. That's kind of cool. So if, if you're talking to a, a desktop app, how would it post a message back without WebRTC? It wouldn't. So uh, okay, like so, I said... So, okay, so I think the thing I'm missing is I'm imagining this as being a generalized thing that works for both desktop and extensions exactly the same. I think you're describing if you want an extension specifically, then having an iframe to talk to is useful. Yeah, so uh, I hadn't really considered the thought of just using WebRTC even for web extensions, um, which is entirely doable. Like, when I don't, yeah, we should just do that. There's no need for an iframe if, um, yeah, like if you're just using WebRTC for everything. I'm still dubious of the need for an iframe for the other one, but we can drop it because you should use WebRTC for everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think you're probably yeah, right there. Pretty good. And then your extension will just talk to your page using WebRTC and then. The security vector has been even more restricted, right? Uh, the attack surface. Because yeah. now they're only sending messages through WebRTC, which is a very limited system, uh, as opposed to through whatever the hell the browser's post me window, post message, window.post message thing does, right? Which might be different for browsers and might be doing X or Y or Z. It is different from browsers. Oh, for sure. <laughs> they, uh, uh, for a simple example, um, Chrome encodes everything via JSON, so you have to you're limited to JSON types. Whereas Firefox encodes via their internal memory management, so you can ship um, more complex JavaScript objects, which include things like big ints, as an example. Mm -hmm. hmm. And that's not specified anywhere. Uh, so yeah, I, I like this. Um, I, like I, th I think. You I think, Sam, you have at least for now convinced me. I, I think we should, when I say we, I mean someone else, should take, take your demo to the next level and see if we can find any rough edges with it. Like, the, the demo is definitely a good start that kind of proves out the idea. I'd just like to see that, you know, can we do the more complicated things that we need to do? Yeah, I think the, the big sticking points are WebRTC, because that's a huge problem in and of itself. Um, and getting so let's say you have a, a, a desktop wallet and an extension installed does the browser show both would be another important one to explore um there, there's a few but i'll do you one even better we can completely wipe wallet connect out because if this link we have now right becomes a qr code then i can scan that qr code from my phone my phone is on the same local network and in this hypothetical situation not uh, behind any firewalls, etc., or behind like the 20 VLANs I have. Um, and my phone, the Rainbow app or the MetaMask app, can simply go, oh shoot, this is an Ethereum EVM URL. I should WebRTC to this uh, address. And then it reads the WebRTC request from the URL, which hopefully, you know, doesn't make the QR code like super duper tiny and precise. Um, 
And then my phone look, is now connected to my browser instance. I look forward to paginated QR codes. <laughs> paginated so, QR codes. Actually, there are animated <laughs> QR codes and they work. Okay, so before before we go anywhere further, um, Sorry. I think I the only close. thing we would need to change about Wallet Connect is it's the way it connects because it doesn't. No, 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 no. I mean, yeah, yes, that that would satisfy Micah, but e even without satisfying Micah, all we would need to do is add a Web Plus to the beginning of Wallet Connect URLs, and then yeah. it would just just work. Because because of the browsers have so, lists of schemes that are allowed to be registered as custom handlers. Uh, so I think just adding Web Plus is all you need. So if you wanted to do this, uh, what you just described with your mobile wallet, which is not uh, on the same machine, essentially you would need a desktop app or a web nope. app just web that app. handles... Yeah, so you need something that registers the handler locally, right? So yes. um, one can imagine, uh, like, no. like Gmail. Gmail registers the mail too, right? And so it's just a web app that I open uh, once no, I, and, I don't and need register a... it. I don't need to register anything on my computer because if... Okay, so so if I'm using a desktop app, then the desktop app registers Web Plus as its schema. And then yep. um, any Web Plus URLs that I click, note the word click, will automatically yep. open up, pop out the window of my desktop app. Um, however, if a web app chooses to display that URL as a QR code and a button... Uh -oh. I can click the button to open my desktop app, and if I scan the QR code yeah. on my phone, it will open the app on my phone. Yeah. Do you see what um, I mean? Yes. It so would you be can nice. use the same link that works for the button for, for opening sure. a desktop app as another device remotely. So the, the thing that I just a little hesitant in is I, it would be nicer if we dApps only needed to have one thing, which was, you know, a Web3 link. And then, right. rather than having to display either a QR code or, or have a clickable link, you just have one thing, user clicks it, and then it's up to the wallet to somehow get registered as the handler for that on the user's machine. So one can imagine, you know, having, like, when, when the user installs a mobile app, tell them, hey, on your desktop, go to this page and click register as the Web3 handler button or whatever. And so that way, when the user clicks the link, it will just open a new tab, which will then just, and that tab's job, that app's job, is just to show you the QR code. And the reason for this is just, I want to be careful of putting too much onus on the DAP developers to support multiple mechanisms for communicating um, with the user. And maybe that's the best UX, and that ends up what we have, we're doing, but it'd be nice if there's just one thing that the, the DAP had to do, not two. That's fair, but how would you make mobile apps work then? With the like the current Wallet Connect system, for example, lets me scan something with my phone to to log in. So I don't even have to have my private key touch the computer ever, right? Uh, so if you're referring to like signing with Ethereum, then I think that yeah. is a separate problem. I mean, it's still connecting a wallet. No, no, no right? yeah, same thing. So. And I think that would be the same, right? So you just you you click the link, and the link would just be a Web three equal slash slash or whatever. And then again, you have a handler app set up on the local host, and all that handler app does, if you're using a mobile wallet, is display a QR code. Like it just turns that into a QR code. Uh, or if you've got a desktop app, then it actually you know opens the actual app or the right. I think I think what Sam is saying, uh, Meridian is saying in chat, is that this is what Coinbase does. Like, like they just their extension is just a QR code presenter, and so it can turn a Web three colon slash slash link into a QR code essentially. Right, but then you'd need an extra extension to be able to use a different device. So, yeah. You can you can register a handler with any like any website can register itself as a handler, I believe, which is how Gmail works, right? Like like Gmail registers itself as a mail to handle. So anytime you click mail to link, right? But then I'd have page. to visit the rainbow page and give them permission before I can use my rainbow app. Yes, yeah, yes. One one or time um, per, per host. What we have now. 
Correct. One time per host, you would the user would need to register their their wallet on that host and say, "Hey, when someone tries to talk to a wallet, make make sure I'm available." And it, I'm not arguing this is definitely the way to go. Um, it's just I think that we have to, we should be considering the the UX difference, like versus making it really really easy for DApps to support everything out of the box without needing to have like two different mechanisms. And I'm not. It's not obvious to me which one matters more here. I mean, theoretically, you could <laughs> make a QR code detector in your extension and find it, so that you don't even need to click anything. But that that's a little ridiculous, I think. That requires everybody to have an extension. So, like, like either the way a DApp initiates a connection is by presenting a QR code, which doesn't work with desktop apps, or the way adapt initiates a connection is with a scheme handler query or we expect adapts to do both and i'm just a little hesitant to expect that adapts to do both i think expecting adapts to do one and then have that one then turn into two under the hood is preferable but i do agree that that is a ux hit and So, I don't know, I, I think just having two, like, right now we have the, oh, by, by the way, we're, we're past time, so if anybody wants to hop off, don't feel obligated to stick around. But, um, yeah, so I, I don't think having wallets show, or dApp show two options is really that bad, right? Like. No. So the, the worry I have is that a new dApp is going to pick the easier one for them and do that first. And then at some point in the future, if they're successful enough, they'll add the other. Um, and so the you know if the scheme handler is the easier one to implement, you know every DApp's going to implement that first, and that means any wallets that support the scheme method will work you know out of the box with those DApps, and things that require the QR method won't work. Whereas if we have a single one that the DApps have to implement, then every DApp works with every wallet out of the box, regardless of whether it you know a mobile wallet or a desktop wallet. So I think then the Coinbase method is probably the best, where if you have a uh, like a external program handler or, or like a camera or a phone, then you have to click on the link and then the extension knows to display the QR code. I think that's... Yeah, yeah but that, that, that requires installing an extension. Uh, you don't need wallet. extension, because remember... Uh, Mail to links are handled by. Oh, yeah. that's web true. You, you just need to go true. to a web page on your computer, like in that browser, and click a button that will register the handler. Like that's that is the the UX pain is that a user who is wanting to use a mobile wallet will need to one time per browser per computer go to a web page and click a button. Yeah, I mean that that's reasonable, I guess. Yeah. I, mean, I, I recognize that is it is a non-zero step for users and maybe not worth it. I'm just, I'm, I'm really worried about, like, we, we already see this, right, where a lot of dApps will only support MetaMask initially, and they don't add other wallet support until later, because, you know, if you have to pick one thing to add, you add MetaMask. And for when you're building an MVP, you pick one thing. You don't add support for 10 things right out of the, out of the have game. Have you seen Rainbow Kit already? Rainbow what? Rainbow Kit. Does it require using Webpack or, or NPM? Mm, it requires using NPM, yeah. Then it's a non-starter for a lot of people. So Rainbow Kit is a React library, so it requires you to use React as well. But yeah, so that's already... <laughs> a React app. Um, right now, if you check it out, they released it like a week or two ago, I think. Some of the wallet sure. connectors? Um, no, no it, not it, wallet it, connect. it um, has wallet Web connect stuff. Um, uh, sure, but it comes with the React. entire UI out of the box, and it's customizable. Yeah, I believe Web3 React does this. So it's trying to solve the same it. problem, and maybe it's better, uh, but this one. Yeah. You want to try it out? So Web3 React is what Uniswap uses, and it's a drop-in React control, if I remember correctly, that just deals with connections, I believe. Um, if you check out the app I put in the chat, 
Uh, it's what I built with a hackathon, what is it, last week at ETH Prog. Um, but we're using uh, Rainbow Kit. So in the top right corner, there's the Connect Wallet button. I've decided to go for no rounded yeah. corners and all that stuff. And then it automatically has <laughs> Rainbow, which is in reality just Wallet Connect with a Rainbow emoji, Coinbase, MetaMask, and Wallet Connect. So all of those four um, work out of the box in any app that has you know, the decency to run two yeah. times, if that makes sense. Yes, so this is, uh, I believe this is exactly the same, uh, solving the same problem as Web3 React. Um, I think this is a good idea, and like providing dApps with an SDK that's just drop in um, for the framework, nice. I think is, is good. Um, and so, so I, so, so yes, I'm a fan of this in general, and my, my only question is, is if we can solve this problem without requiring a user to um, use a, you know, Yes, yeah, so UI plug for their thing. Well. That'd be nice. Right. Uh, again, yeah. I, I'm not married to this, and I could probably convince that the UX is not worth it. But I guess what I'm thinking in my head is if we can make it so by default, everything works with the scheme handler um, one way or another. So then the minimum viable app will input the scheme handler. Alternatively, if you want to natively within your app support the scheme handler and QR code, so the user doesn't have to, you know, go through that extra hop. Then you can, and that's a better user experience for your users, and dApps will be encouraged. And we can have things like Web3 React or WagMe or um, Rainbow Web3 Kit. Web3 Modal. Uh, or... Yeah, as as kind of like add-ons, but they're not required to have your, your dApp work with everything. So, like, if everything supports the Web3 Scheme Handler in some way or another, then that's kind of like the, the lowest common denominator. And then we can do better. And I think that's great, and we should, and DAP should try to do some better. But it's not required to work with Wallet. I think we're mostly on the same page here, it sounds like. I like it. I vibe with it. And I, I very much appreciate the fact that you very, that you're very uh, insistent, consistent, whatever, um, on, I don't speak English, um, and I might be slightly under influence, um, but you're insistent, consistent, whatever, on the whole, um, making sure it is still fully decentralized and still privacy preserving and that somebody in their off-grid hut in the middle of nowhere could run it without having to talk to a wallet connect server, right? Yeah, that's, that, that yeah. is, I, I did not realize that that is possible, um, Oh, it's very without... possible. Yeah, so I, I'm a big fan now of yeah. all of this. Like, like I'm going to have to digest some of this information. Um, but yes, I'm a huge fan of getting rid of those central servers. Especially, I really like the idea of if your cell phone's on the same LAN as your computer, you should not need to go to a stunt server. Yeah. Um, like, you should be able to just... Like, I, I really want mobile... Because mobile devices tend to have far better... Um, Better what UI UX kind of thing? Just like like they have TPMs built into every mobile device these days, and the uh, sandboxing of apps on your mobile device is far better than on your desktop. Yes, and so the the attack surface against stealing your private keys on from mobile are very different than stealing your private keys from a desktop. Yep, and so um, I want mobile wallets to work because I think they're a nice step between hardware wallets and desktop wallets. Uh -huh. um, but I've just, I have never gotten into them because of that need for that middleman. And so if we can get rid of that, I, that'd be amazing. Second that. Yeah. Okay, so who's going to go build all this? <laughs> <laughs> who's going to go build all this? That's a good one. Um, I'm currently doing some updates on a variety of my sites. Uh, I'm waiting for rpclist.xyz, which I bought and built a site for and deployed uh, to actually properly start functioning. I'm having some stupid DNS issue, but the rest of the thing works. Um, sorry, I'm trying to triple task here, but it's not really like, you know, I'm still me. Um, 
Yeah, I definitely can't take on another project. Um. <laughs> yeah, that's it's going to be a bit of work. I sadly don't have any time in the next like week or two. Um, so I think perhaps perhaps a, a good question is, is how do we transition from the world we are living in today to this hypothetical world where we have scheme handlers as a mechanism for Dabs Connect talking to wallets? Um, I mean, we first have to get some kind of demo working and verify that we can actually make it happen. Uh, sure, but like, even if you even if you do all that, like, there's the chicken and the egg problem, right? How you do you get that to switch? Every yes, yes, and uh, like, or we convince every wallet to implement this, and then, yes. as well as implementing the old way, and then encourage DApps to use the new mechanism. Yep, um, both of these are very hard. Um, I think you could come up with something like all new. RPC endpoints are only supported on the like new connection method. So old apps aren't don't break, and new apps that want to use the fancier stuff um, would have to use the new connection method. That means every app is now going to have to support both old and new mechanisms. Hmm. Yeah, I suppose. Which seems, which seems uh, unlikely to ever come to pass. Um, can we? Is there some mechanism by which we could create a browser extension whose only job is to envelope and things into uh, this WebRTC mechanism? So it would be an extension that injects into the page, and it takes all the legacy JSON RPC stuff and converts it into so WebRTC it would stuff. it would talk to some other thing. So it would provide a default provider that. Um, uses WebRTC on the back end. Yeah, that'd be that'd be doable. Yeah. So then wallets would stop supporting the old way of doing it, and then yeah, yeah. So, okay. have to, so so wallets would stop supporting the old way, but if you've got a legacy DAP, um, users can still access it by installing this, um, you know, like envelope extension, extension. Kind of thing. Yes. Shim or polyfill. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Like polyfill is a good word. For polyfill it. wallet. <laughs> there you go, Polly for a We've got a name for it already. We're basically done. We're basically done. We just got to actually make sure that we build the entirety of. Web. I mean, the name is the name is the hard part. Everybody, the knows. name is hard. Polly for a I've Written it is down. I'll buy the so address. Done. Okay. So, so okay. can we actually just take Wallet Connect, change the like? I, I know nothing about the libraries or their implementation. Can we just change the URL to Web Plus WC and then try it? Basically, yeah. I mean, they already do a similar thing, but then with Wallet Connect, Wallet Connect colon, or whatever the hell it is. I don't know. Let's have a look. Um, edge server.io, log out, log in, rainbow. Yeah, so that, that's what I mean, uh, Sam. Can we just take their weird URI, put web plus in front of it, and then yeah. try that? Yeah. So this is cool. On my iPhone, if I scan any of the Wallet Connect URLs, it automatically says camera wants to open rainbow. And then I press open, and then it just does the rest of the magic. It's ridiculous how well Wallet Connect works, but it is also ridiculous that it managed to get this big while still being partially centralized. It works for me, uh, Sam. Being centralized is the easiest way to get big. Yeah. I mean, decentralizes the hard way. The yeah, it is. But it is the better way. I agree with that. Okay, well, my brain is full. I need to, some time to commit all this to long term neural pathways. Sounds good. So I can think harder on it. I <laughs> My camera is still stuck on this one. I love that. I'm not here. You're a ghost. I'm I'm totally not here. Hi. Um, <laughs> I am a ghost. All right. So, uh, right, yeah, no worries. It's funny. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming out, guys. Uh, ZK, if you can send me a, a, a link when you have the recording um, up somewhere, I'll, I'll write some... Hmm, meeting notes and everything so yeah awesome cool sounds good we'll do
thanks guys talk to y'all in about a month maybe at a different time all right oh uh, are any of you coming to eth nyc not i no hmm. or eth barcelona or eth paris or okay i'm gonna be everywhere so like i don't leave my house i yeah Alright. Talk to you guys later. Alright. Take care. Bye. Have a good one, everyone.